We're so glad that you are here with us. We are finishing up our series, Grace and Truth. And next week, I am so excited to be starting a brand new series called The Unseen World. We're gonna be exploring the realm of angels and demons. It is gonna be a very fascinating uh, series. I can't wait to start that. But today, we're gonna finish up Grace and Truth. And our foundational text for this series has been John 1.14. It says that Jesus came full of grace and truth. And, and as followers of Jesus, we're called to be filled with both grace and truth as well. The problem is we all tend to kind of lean more towards one or the other. And then last week, we talked about the one that is kind of missing the most, I would say, in American Christianity, and that is the truth aspect. I think Christians in general do a great job at loving people, showing grace to people, but we kind of shy away from telling the truth because we don't want to offend. So we looked at how if you love your neighbor, you'll actually tell your neighbor the truth. And so today I wanna talk about what it means to speak the truth, right? Like if we're supposed to speak the truth in love, like Ephesians 4.15 says, then what is truth, right? Truth is the absolute standard by which reality is measured, all right, one plus one equals two. That is a fixed, absolute standard by which reality is measured. If it wasn't, we wouldn't be able to do math. And so in the same way that there are, are fixed, absolute standards in math, there are fixed, absolute standards when it comes to morality. There are, are fixed, moral standards that exist outside of us and they are independent of us, which means it doesn't matter whether you agree with them, it doesn't matter whether you like them, it doesn't care how you feel about them, right? Truth transcends feelings and emotions, right? Like just because you feel a certain way about something doesn't make that thing, you know, true or not because this is something that is a fixed standard that exists outside of us. So what is this fixed standard that determines morality and truth. Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So God's word is the source of truth for our lives. The location where God has determined truth to be found is his word, which means if you wanna know the truth on any subject, the first place you should turn to is the word of God. And when God's word has clearly spoken on any subject, that is the end of the debate. And so the only question is whether or not we will allow the truth to change us or will we attempt to change the truth. See, the builder generation, those born between 1927 and 1945, 65% Bible-based believers. The boomers, all right, are 35% Bible-based believers. The buster gen or gen X, 16% Bible-based believers. And millennials in gen Z, 2% Bible-based believers. Now, you might be seeing that and thinking, wait, that is way too low. But the key word in this study is Bible-based believers. See, 61% of American millennials claim to be Christian, but only 2% have a biblical worldview. 61% confess Jesus as Lord, call themselves Christians, but only 2% believe what the Bible says. Only 2% say the word of God is the standard and the lens through which I interpret life. And so it's time for those who have confessed Jesus as Lord to return to the truth. John 8, 31 says this, uh, Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. So you cannot be a disciple of Jesus and reject his word. It doesn't work, right? You can't say I'm a follower of Jesus if you don't hold the word of God as the highest authority in your life. If God's word is not the highest authority, you are not a disciple. You are not following Jesus, now, I'm not saying you're not a Christian, right? That's above my pay grade to determine who's in and who's out. But according to Jesus, if you are a disciple and you are actively following Jesus, you are going to abide in his word. You are gonna live by his word. You're gonna acknowledge his word as the highest authority in your life. God's word is not gonna be a perspective or an opinion on a subject. It is gonna be the final word on every subject. And so as followers of Jesus, we must seek, 
seek, study, and submit to God's truth in every area of our lives. That's what it means to follow Jesus. But here's the thing. If you reject God's word as the the source of truth in your life, well, something else has to become that standard. Something else has to be put in the place of God's word that determines for you what is true. And so if you reject God's word, do you know what you put instead of that? You put yourself. So I become the standard of right and wrong. I become the standard of good and evil. I determine what's true and what's false. And this is actually the original temptation that came to mankind. Remember in the beginning, God placed Adam and Eve in a garden that was called Eden. And the word Eden means paradise. And the reason why that they called this place paradise is because Adam and Eve didn't have (laughs) in-laws. Adam was like, wait, no mother-in-law to tell me how I'm supposed to raise my kids and live my life? He's like, this is paradise. (laughs) Marie, if you're watching, I'm just kidding. You're a fantastic mother-in-law. We love you and appreciate you so much. (laughs) Sorry, allergies, something in here. But, but no, like, like God placed them in this perfect place, this garden. There's only one rule, though, that God gave them. God said, you can't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the only rule that God gave them. And so, of course, we know what happened. Uh, the serpent, the enemy came into the garden and tempts Eve, and he said, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Of course, we all know what happened. Eve decided to eat from the tree, which is why women to this day still can't decide on where to eat. (laughs) Goes right back to here, right? Last time they made that decision, they doomed all of humanity, (laughs) which is why when you're like, tell your wife, hey, where do you want to eat? She's like, ah, I don't care. Okay, let's eat here. Well, no, I don't want to eat there, right? Uh, They can never decide. And it all goes all the way back to the garden, right? But but the temptation wasn't really about the fruit. It was about what that fruit would produce, what it would do for them. It would give them the ability to determine good and evil apart from God. See, God wanted them to be dependent on him and his word for what is good and what is evil. And so the serpent came and said, hey, if you eat this, You can determine good and evil apart from God. You can be like God. That was the original temptation. And it's the same temptation that humanity keeps falling for over and over again. We reject God's definition of good and evil and decide to determine that for ourselves. So what's good and what's evil is no longer determined by God or even objective reality, but rather how I feel. So if my objective reality is male, if biologically I'm a male, but I feel like I'm a female, well, now I can be a woman because what is true and what is real is no longer based in reality. It's based on how I feel. Truth is whatever I want it to be. Truth is not what's real, it's what I feel. And so we just bounce around until we find somebody who says what we like, and then we say, well, now that is my truth. And this mindset has now infiltrated Christianity. One of the most well-known, if not the most well-known pastor in America was being interviewed, and he was asked about his church's stance on a particular moral issue that was really clear, And instead of answering that question from the word of God, he said, well, the important thing is that you find a church that believes whatever you believe on that subject. The important thing is you gotta find a church that aligns with your beliefs. Look, what I believe does not matter. The only thing that matters is what has God said. (laughs) My beliefs on any subject are irrelevant. The only thing that matters is what has God said. And in one of the top, well-known pastors, if not the most well-known pastor in America, says, well, what you believe about morality, that's, you know, I mean, what God's word says about morality is irrelevant. It's whatever you believe. And so you find a church that lines up with your preferences. And, and I was absolutely shocked when I heard it, but we shouldn't be shocked because the Bible prophesied that this day would come. 
2 Timothy 4.3 says, the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. See, this is what happens when we become the standard of truth, right? We just bring people around our lives who suit our desires and tell us what we want to hear. And unfortunately, you don't have to go very far in America to find people who will do just that because preaching in America is more popularity-driven than truth-driven. You know, so people say, um, they say truth is whatever you sincerely believe. Look, you can walk off the ledge of a building, but gravity will care nothing about your sincerity, right? Right? You can walk off sincerely believing you won't fall, but gravity does not care at all about your sincerity. Truth is not whatever you sincerely believe. Truth is based in reality, and moral truth is based on how God created humanity to function and flourish. Some people say, well, that might be true for you, but my truth is different than your truth. Okay, so if we both walk off the ledge of a building, I'll fall because I believe in gravity and you'll hover in the air because you don't? <laughs> no, that's, that's not how it works, right? Because truth is true for everyone, right? What's true for one is true for everyone because that is the nature of truth. And so you don't have your truth. No, you have your experience. You have your opinion. You have your feelings, which, which all have th- their place, but that doesn't mean that they're true. In fact, when our experience and our opinion and our feelings don't line up with truth, we're told to change. But we live in a culture that says, if you don't affirm my experience, my opinion, or my feelings, well, then you're not being loving. Sorry, friends, 1 Corinthians 13 says that love rejoices with the truth, not in evil. God's kind of love does not celebrate, approve, or endorse that which God calls sinful. Some people say, well, truth is what the majority of people believe. Look, the majority of people can get together and they can vote to suspend gravity tomorrow, but it will have zero impact on gravity, right? Gravity will not be suspended just because a group of people vote on it. See, Americans embrace democratic ideals, which gives us the illusion that we have a voice to say in what is true. But truth is not a democracy. Truth is not a ballot measure. We can discover truth, but we cannot create it. What's true is always gonna be true. Whether or not the majority of people believe it and what's wrong is gonna be wrong, no matter who passes legislation to say it's right. Truth is not up for revision. It is determined by God himself. See, Judges 21, 25 says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. See, this is what happens when there is no standard of truth. Everyone does what's right in their own eyes. And if you read the rest of that story there, it, lead, it led to chaos and destruction because there were no guardrails. There was no standard of truth to keep people from falling off of a cliff. And so today I want, I want to give you four reasons why we cannot be the standard of truth, why we cannot determine truth for ourselves. Number one, we're finite. See, see in, in order for you to become the standard of truth, you would need to know everything about everything. And there is only one person who is all knowing and he is God. Like our knowledge is extremely limited. And just when you think that as human beings, we know so much now, just look at things that people believed 50 years ago. And if you look at the things that people believed and did 50 years ago, you'd realize we don't know a whole lot, okay? For example, 50 years ago, this is how people tried to lose weight. 50 years ago, people believed you could literally shake it off, right? Right? You don't gotta work out and move and lift up. No, hook yourself up to this machine and it will jiggle the fat off of your body. 50 years ago, all right? 50 years ago, women could not get a credit card. If a woman wasn't married and she walked into a bank to try to get a credit card and she did not have another man who would co-sign on that card, they would not give her a credit card. Just 50 years ago. Somebody like, is that why they called it the good old days? 
I don't know. I wasn't around back then, okay? So I'm just, I'm just telling you the facts, right? This is what happened, right? How about this? In the 60s, seatbelts weren't a thing. Seriously, right? Yeah, exactly. Not only did they not have seatbelts, but they made it easier for a kid to fly through the windshield. <laughs> he can go straight through without hitting anything else in the car. In 1966, only 30% of U.S. vehicles had seatbelts. Seatbelts were optional in cars. It wasn't until the mid-80s where the first seatbelt law made it into the books. And, and probably one of the strangest things that people did 50 years ago is this right here. <laughs> they believed that fish and vegetables belonged in jello rings, right? This is a tuna fish, olive and radish jello ring, right? This was acceptable to serve a human being at dinner time 50 years ago. Thank God we've learned a lot since then, okay? When you look at things that people just did 50 years ago, you're like, how did people, anyone believe that was a good idea, right? And it's because our knowledge is always learning. We're always gaining more information. And every time we gain more information, we realize that there are some things that we did and that we believed that were absolutely wrong. In a couple years from now, there's going to be things that we are practicing and doing right now in our society that are going to change because we've learned more about it. And so we cannot be the standard for truth because we are always learning more and more. And if you're going to be the standard, you need to be all-knowing. Number two, we're sinful. We cannot be the standard of truth because we are a sinful bunch. 64% of Americans say, I will lie when it suits me if it doesn't cause any real damage. 53% of Americans say, I will cheat on my spouse. After all, given the chance, he or she will do the same. Only 31% of Americans agree that honesty is the best policy. And when asked what they would do for $10 million, 25% said they would abandon their family. 23% said they would become prostitutes for a week or more. And 7% would murder a stranger. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's how crazy it is. Like, you you'd murder somebody? Like, it's, it's $10 million. That's not that much nowadays, right? You might be able to buy a house in California with that one-bedroom studio, but, you know, you can, you can get something in there. Like, it's crazy. This is why we cannot be the standard of truth. I think Jeremiah 17, 9 sums it all up when it says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? This is why I can't have my truth because my heart is wicked. My desires get twisted. My perception can be clouded by past experiences. And so it's easy to confuse what I want to be true, what I feel is true with what is actually true. So we can't be the standard. We're sinful people. And only God knows the, the, the ramifications, how deeply sin has impacted each and every one of us here, which is why we cannot be the standard. Number three, We are prone to deception. First Timothy 4.1 says, now the spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Demons have a school. And it's not just unbelievers who are enrolled in this school. There are people inside the church who are enrolled in this school. There are people who profess Jesus as Lord who are enrolled in this school and they are going to depart from the faith because they've been deceived by these demonic spirits, right? In order for someone to depart from the faith, guess what they have to be? They have to be in the faith first. If your plane is departing from Albany, Georgia, you have to first be in Albany in order to depart from Albany. This is not talking about the world departing from truth and common sense. It's talking about those inside the faith. Why? Because the devil is a deceiver. He is a con man from the beginning, and he is still conning people. He is a master at deception. He is eloquent, persuasive, believable, and we are gullible. So not only do our own hearts deceive us, but there are demonic spirits actively working to deceive us. And if that's not bad enough, we live in a culture that is deceived. Not only are we as individuals prone to deception, but culture itself is deceived. 
See, many people think, well, yeah, I get why like, you know, every individual can't just determine right and wrong truth you know, for themselves because it would lead to chaos and society itself would crumble to the ground. But surely whatever the majority of people agree on, whatever the majority of people believe, well, that can be true. And so we, we, we allow truth to be determined by opinion polls in the whims of culture. That's a bad idea. Because if you thought what people believed 50 years ago was crazy, what people believed and practiced 100 years from ago, I mean, it is absolutely shocking what people believed and did just 100 years ago. For example, 100 years ago, physicians, doctors endorsed cigarettes, right? 20,000 doctors agree that luckies are less irritating, right? Throw protection against irritation, against cough. They thought smoking would help you get rid of that pesky cough that you have. They actually said that cigarettes would temporarily relieve asthma. (laughs) You don't need that inhaler. Just puff on this. No, friends, that's going to make it worse. These doctor-endorsed cigarette ads persisted well into the 60s. How about this? There were no child labor laws 100 years ago. 100 years ago, some kids would go to school to get an education while other kids would go to the coal mines and to the factories to start working. Nobody thought, maybe we should educate children instead of putting them to work when they're seven. All right? Uh, Coca-Cola, 100 years ago, had cocaine in it. That's right. John Pemberton in 1885 created the original recipe for Coca-Cola. A pharmacist in Atlanta, Georgia made it in his backyard and it contained cocaine. Yes, it does help headaches, uh, neuralgia, hysteria, melancholy. Feeling a little down? Yeah, cocaine will pick you up a little bit. (laughs) Cocaine. (laughs) That's where coca, the coca of Coca-Cola, cocaine. Why have we not changed the name? (laughs) Cocaine is where that came from, right? A hundred years ago, leeches and bloodletting were a common medical procedure all over the world, right? They were said to be especially helpful in hard to reach and sensitive areas, like inside the ears, the nose, the mouth, in even more intimate places. <laughs> Can we all thank God for modern medicine? It's like, I have a problem here. Put a leech in it. You know, like, what? <laughs> thank God for modern medicine and doctors and nurses today. Holy moly. They believe leeches could cure fever, flatulence, toothaches, and even hemorrhoids. But hey, don't worry. If, if leeches could not cure the common cold, don't worry, because heroin was ready, readily available to cure it. The primary ingredient in cough syrup was heroin 100 years ago. Look at this. The problem has been solved by heroin. I'm so glad I got rid of that pesky cough I had. Now if I can just kick this drug addiction I picked up. I can get on with my life. This is crazy. This is stuff that people believed and practiced a hundred years ago. We look back on it and we go, this was absolutely ridiculous. Yet it was commonly accepted by culture. Nobody questioned these things at all. And I'm telling you, a hundred years from now, people will look back at some of our laws, our practices, and our beliefs, and they're going to say, how could anyone believe that? How could anyone have thought that was a good idea? Culture is frequently wrong about so many issues. They cannot be allowed to determine what is true. I mean, you look throughout history, many cultures and societies uh, uh, approved and celebrated the murder of innocent people. In first century Rome, it was considered entertainment to go to the Colosseum where uh, the Caesar would take Christians and feed them alive to lions. That was entertainment. That was like going to the movies. Look, can you believe how bad this world has gotten? Not that bad, right? Uh, or how about you know Nazi Germany, where a large majority of people went along with the extermination of six million Jews. 
People say, oh, culture is, society has advanced so much since then. Not so much, because in the United States of America, 65 million babies have been aborted since Roe v. Wade. Hitler killed 6 million Jews. Abortion has killed 65 million in America alone. Worldwide, 1.5 billion in the last 50 years. See, society, culture has improved, endorsed, celebrated so many evil, unjust, wicked laws and practices, and yet they were widely accepted by culture, which is why culture cannot determine for us what is true, right? We cannot be the standard of truth because we are finite, we are sinful, we are prone to deception, and we live in a contaminated culture. And so we need a standard outside of ourselves, independent of us, that can determine truth for us. If you want absolute truth, you need an absolute source. If you want perfect truth, you need a perfect source. And there is only one who is perfect. There's only one who is true. And there is only one who never lies, which is God himself. I love Romans 3, 4. It says, let God be true and every man a liar. That means if you disagree with God, you're a liar. <laughs> He's right, you're wrong. Because when you know everything about everything, you can't be wrong. When you know the past, the present, and the future, you can't be wrong. When you made it all, sustain it all, and will one day destroy it all, you can't be wrong, which is why God is the only one to be able to determine for us a standard for what is true. I'm telling you, the biggest threat to Christianity in America, it's not the agenda that Hollywood is pushing on our children. It's concerning, but it is not the biggest threat. The biggest threat is not the uh, uh, demonization of the music industry. Concerning, yes, but it's not the biggest threat to Christianity, right? Doja Cat's music video isn't the biggest threat to Christianity, right? People are like, oh my God, can you believe this? This is so demonic. Yes, she's dressed up like a demon, right? It, it takes zero deception to go, yeah, something's off there. You know, like that's a no-brainer, right? That is not the biggest threat to Christianity. Concerning, problematic, yes, but the biggest threat to Christianity is a low view of Scripture. Like society itself can lose their minds, but as long as those inside the church hold to a high view of Scripture, we're gonna be okay. We're not gonna drift away from the faith. The greatest threat to Christianity is a low view of Scripture. See, 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. Scripture is the inspired, infallible, authoritative word of God. It's inspired, which means that it is God-breathed, that, that this is the voice of God in print. This wasn't something that man came up with and then God said, you know what, that's a good idea, I'll breathe on that. No, the scripture says that God moved upon these men and women of old to put pen to paper and to give us the word of God. It is the breath of God in these words. And it's infallible meaning it is without error. Did God use imperfect people to write this book? Yes, but it's perfect in what it communicates. And it's authoritative, which means it has the right to guide my life. It teaches me good from evil. It corrects, rebukes, and it trains me in righteousness. And not just some of it, but all of it, because there's this idea going around right now that there are some parts that are inspired by God and there are some parts that aren't. So all the verses about love, acceptance, and kindness, well, those were inspired by God. But the ones that call out my sin, that ones that deal with the, the bentness, the crookedness, and the twistedness in my own heart, well, those weren't inspired by God. That's just what those people thought God was like at the time it was written. No, friends, all scripture, including the parts that I don't like, including the parts that are labeled hate speech on social media, including the parts that are offensive, they're all inspired by God and beneficial. The scripture's not always convenient, but it's always beneficial. It's not convenient because it calls out my sin, it, it highlights my selfishness, it confronts my values, my prejudices, it rebukes my unbelief, but it's beneficial because it encourages my faith. It fills me with hope and it gives me a firm foundation that I can build my life upon. All scripture is inspired, infallible, and authoritative. 
which means if you want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, you need to turn to the Word of God. And so as followers of Jesus, our question on every subject should be, what has God said? And when God has clearly spoken on a subject, that's the end of the debate. Amen? Amen. If you guys would please bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God, I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now because the Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed God's standard, which is perfection. If you want to know who does God let into heaven, perfect people. Perfect people are the only ones who get in. God's standard is perfection because he is a perfect and holy God. And the only people who are going to get in there based on their own merit and their own goodness are those who are perfect. But none of us meet that qualification. So God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross for our sins, was buried. And three days later, he rose again so that by believing in him, you could be forgiven. You could have a fresh start, a clean slate, and you could enter into a relationship with God. But there has to come a moment where you choose to receive what Jesus did for you, where you believe in what he did on the cross, and then you commit to making his word and his truth the highest authority in your life. That's what it means to accept Jesus as your Lord. It's to say, I'm not going to be the final authority in my life any longer. I'm going to submit that to you, and you will be the highest authority in my life. And so it's not enough to simply go to church or simply to believe in what Jesus did. There has to come a moment where you ask him to be your Lord and your Savior. And so if you're here today and you're ready to make that decision, I want to pray for you right where you're at. If you just are ready to make that decision today, would you just slip your hand up in the air so I can see who I'm praying for today? Thank you, I see those hands. Thank you. Yes, sir, in the middle. Thank you, in the back. Thank you, I see that hand. Thank you, I see that hand as well over there. Anyone else here? Just slip it up real quick. Thank you, I see that hand. Young man, thank you. Yes, sir, I see that hand. Thank you. God, I pray for those who lifted their hands. God, I thank you that that simple acknowledgement that Jesus Christ is Lord, that surrendering our lives to you, God, is the beginning of a brand new day in our life. God, I thank you that the old is gone, the new has come. God, I thank you that you are taking the broken places of their life, God, and you are making something beautiful out of them. God, I thank you that you are changing, transforming them from the inside out. God, I pray that they would experience your mercy and your grace, washing their sin away as far as the east is from the west. God, that you don't even remember their sin anymore, that it's thrown into the sea of forgetfulness and you're never gonna bring it up again. God, I thank you that today is the start of a brand new day. God, I pray that you would fill them with your spirit, with your power, help them to overcome every challenge and obstacle that they're facing when they walk out of this place. And may they know that they are not alone, that you are with them. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.